Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Kilowatt, an episode of the real Ghostbusters produced by Deke. So you know I like to hit you with air dates relating to the first time I saw the episodes of many a cartoon over here in the UK. This episode first aired on January the 25th 1988 on Children's ITV and I did catch it the first time around even though like all of those cartoons that aired on Children's ITV and the much celebrated 4.20pm spot a scene or two was removed for time and I definitely remember one of the edits because when the episode was repeated they showed it uncut, thank goodness. Len Jansen and Chuck Manville wrote this episode, they wrote many of the original 13 ABC network episodes over here in the UK, syndication wasn't a thing, so those first 78 episodes, 13 network and 65 syndicated, were all jumbled together, but it thankfully didn't affect our enjoyment of the show. When this cartoon aired, it was huge at my school. I was attending Forty Hill School at the time, and my classmates loved it as much as I did, so much so that... Oh, do I tell this story here? Yeah, I may as well. So, in 1988, our class were put into teams of four and had to create a project all about the human body and what went into making it work. Myself and, I'm going to do my best to remember my classmates' names, Andreas Hadjusevas, Benjamin Keep, and Philip East. I hope I got all those names right. We called our project Germ Busters. <laughs> and I illustrated a comic book featuring us busting germs and the teacher loved it. And here's the funny thing, the project proved to be so popular that soon I was expanding the Germ Busters team in the comic until we had eight or so members from my class. Everyone wanted to be a Germ Buster. Best thing of all, while I may not have the original comic, I do still have the comics I drew from 1988 until about 1990, at which point my love of comic books influenced the change, and some of the germ busters now had secret identities. Yeah, it didn't last much longer after that as you can imagine. Back to the episode, I wrote a rather fun synopsis for the DVD booklet that accompanied the Time Life DVD box set that I think still holds up. <clears throat> Power blackouts across New York turn out to be the work of a veritable army of ghosts. They drain power from generators and power lines, leaving the containment unit vulnerable. Armed with a car generator and a bicycle, Janine becomes the final line of home defense, while the Ghostbusters race off to deal with the problem at its source. Yeah, I'm happy with how that came out. This scene with Ray feeding his fellow Ghostbusters was actually one of the first scenes edited out for time during the initial UK airing. It went from the workman encountering the possessed power line to Janine yelling, Rollam! So it did kind of work. That's the thing, when the UK edited episodes of He-Man, She-Ra, The Real Ghostbusters, etc., they did remove scenes that would not affect the narrative. The removal of the aforementioned scene most definitely did not. Actually, given the animation in that scene where Ray feeds his fellow Ghostbusters, I'm glad I didn't see it. As I'll talk about during this episode, you're going to see more than a few animation style changes. So much so that, at some point, I'll make a video pointing out all of the changes. I'll start off with a fact. Although this was the second episode to air, it was the first to undergo production. This was not uncommon with animated shows during the 80s, especially as episode orders began to get bigger and bigger. Plus, you have to remember, or understand, that episodes weren't being produced one at a time. Scripts were being written, episodes were being storyboarded, characters were being designed, voice tracks were being recorded, the animation was being sent overseas to the relevant studios, nothing was done in set batches, so the talent involved would often find themselves working on numerous episodes within a single week, and this continued month after month, year after year in fact. Fun times. And now the Ghostbusters are entering the levitating Stacy's department store. Hmm. Methinks this location may be influenced by Maces. Now, right off the bat, we're going to see some visual changes already. Look at how the Ghostbusters are illustrated as they explore the store by flashlight. Look at how different Egon looks when compared to the previous scene at the firehouse. This is your first clue that numerous Japanese studios or animation teams may be working on this one single episode and it's about to get even more strikingly different. It's just as I suspected. 
ghosts have invaded the mall's electrical wiring. I love that a majority of the theme song is played during this action-packed non-stop scene. It's great. Plus, kudos to the artist that created these designs, bringing to life household appliances and turning them into vicious man-eating monsters. Now here we're about to see the work of another animation studio. The drills are now animated with Verocity and the group shot has all the animation movement of a group shot animated by a Japanese A team of animators rather than the C team. Be sure to look at Peter here as he reacts to the out of shot danger. Again, this wasn't the style present when the episode began. All right, then let's test their warranty. Speaking of these hardware design ghosts, the late great Everett Peck, who designed many classic ghosts for the series, almost definitely had a hand in these. The action scenes here are so beautifully storyboarded and directed. The timing, the quickness, it creates a very kinetic feel to the events unfolding. Again, I'm going to keep doing this throughout this episode. Pay attention to Egon as he is sucked out of shot and look at his body mass when he is on the ground. Again, different studio. Egon's proportions are kind of heroic and his glasses are drawn as simple circles with little detail but the cells of the character are still fantastically rendered. And coming up is one of my favourite shots from the episode, so much so that I featured it in the Serial Geek TV introduction sequence. Get ready for it. Don't say that. Yes, I love that sequence. Peter swoops around, the proton gun even trails some energy before exploding in a furious blast. Now quick, Look at this green ghost that Peter has in his beam. Look at the frantic movement, the design, then watch as he is sucked into the trap. Go back and pause the image if you have to. It's crazily evident right there that there are at least three or four teams working on this action sequence. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's bad, but my goodness, what I wouldn't give to have the A team of animators working on this scene from start to finish. There just seems to be a lack of energy, even literally, for the remainder of this action scene. No urgency. Zap, zap, zap. It looks so bland at this point. You don't even need to be someone that has studied animation for 40 years to notice these changes. And look at the ghosts all in a circle having a good old moan. But there is one ghost who is my hero. Watch this little purple guy trying to escape. <laughs> yeah, he nearly made it. He's my favourite. But again, if you look at how those ghosts are animated compared to that green ghost scrambling to escape the proton beam, it's like night and day. And speaking of another green ghost, here's poor old Slimer getting zapped by Ray in a rather odd scene with no real payoff. Also, when Ray realises, why doesn't he immediately stop? <laughs> I do like how they illustrate the little singed Slimer with his burnt bits but also the little parts of slime that have fallen off him. Poor Slimer. Now again, look at this Egon speaking to the crowd, not even remotely close to that look the character sported when being dragged towards the giant possessed cooker. That's actually one thing to point out about with the first 13 episodes that aired on the ABC network. There were more than a few occasions when animation teams would clearly change mid-episode. By comparison, the syndicated seasons most of the time stuck with one studio or animation team from start to finish on a single episode. One little thing I always loved was the effort put into animating the sequence in which the Ghostbusters unload the trap into the containment unit. And now we have a trope of the network season. The containment unit loses its power, the alarm sound and the threat of all the ghosts being released is a possibility. But on this occasion, Egon has installed a backup generator, something we don't see any other time in the series, which is a shame. Now it could be argued that's because the generator <laughs> runs away, which it's about to do, but I'm sure Egon could have built another one. All right. A genius. Yes, I know. And you'll notice that these scenes are clearly the work of the same animation team that worked on the opening scene with the Ghostbusters at the firehouse. Again, it's a great design here, turning a generator into a little horned demon dog type thing that runs away. Egon's little uh, as it leaves is priceless. And this is the rather cool part of the episode. The threat is not over yet. 
an unknown ghostly force is still causing power blackouts. Arsenio Hall's delivery of this next line is so good. It really feels that his everyman voice of the Ghostbusters hits home with this line, highlighting dramatically the severity of the situation. Right, because when this thing blows, we're going to be up to our eyeballs and angry spirits and demons. Bravo, Arsenio, and Marsha Goodman, voice directing these fine talents. What will happen next? Speaking of great line deliveries, I give you Maurice LaMarche. Don't take this the wrong way, but in 50 seconds, we die. And if that wasn't perfect enough, check out this exquisite yell of frustration by Laura Summer. Ah! Now, watch the style change again. This close-up of Peter and Ray will be followed by a very Japanese style of character design, very heroic looking, and we'll see the style go back and forth during this sequence. Also, I love the term pedal locomotion device to describe a bicycle. If I had to criticise one thing about this scene, I feel that the music used throughout really does undermine the drama we're seeing unfold. Yes, as with most things in Ghostbusters, there's a comedy element involved, rightfully so. But yeah, this music should be used in a scene with far less drama. <laughs> it's, it's so funny watching the visuals jump rather blatantly between the two different studios. We get it again when we see the Ghostbusters celebrating in a circle. They're illustrated by a team of Japanese artists who really aren't adhering to the visual design we see in the close-ups. This is a great little scene with the Ghostbusters really going into team mode to solve a problem and Bless Janine, look at her go. Again, as the Ghostbusters heroically exit the shot, look at the way they're illustrated, it's so Japanese. And I understand that some people may not be able to distinguish these multiple styles, but it's like being able to spot when Toei Doga animate an episode of Spider-Man and his amazing friends, or Tokyo Movie Shinsha have their A-team of animators work on an episode of Galaxy High School, or when Ashi Productions animate an episode of Mask. There are always visual clues to look out for, some more obvious than others. Really nice shot here of Ecto-1 going across the Brooklyn Bridge. To me, this shot always brings back memories of the movie when Ray and Winston have just had their conversation about Judgment Day. And that is a lovely shot with the entire city of New York experiencing a total blackout. Not sure whereabouts in Brooklyn this power plant is supposed to be, but my guess is that it's really rather out of town. I do like that the power plant is made to look like a monster of sorts because you'll see what happens soonish. This scene is so silly with Slimer accidentally moving the Ecto-1. Did someone not apply the handbrake or something? It's a wonderfully directed scene, and I love Slimer's reaction when Winston asks Slimer to do something. Slimer looks at the wheel momentarily, and then it cuts to a shot of him through the windshield with his arms raised, screaming. Yeah! It's a break! That always tickles me. The gag with Slimer shutting himself in the glove compartment is made all the better with the hilarious animation of him squeezing himself in. I remember as a kid being very confused by Winston's line here. In the UK, the front of a car isn't a hood, it's a bonnet. Just what I always wanted to be, a hood ornament. So I thought Winston's line about being a hood ornament was actually a hood order man. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what's a hood order man? <laughs> also, always nice to see Peter take the lead, be proactive and save the day. One thing about the real Ghostbusters, they must have had a great time during the recording sessions performing the group screams. I realise that some of these screams become stock and are used over and over again in the series, but many are exclusive to the recording of the episodes they're intended for. Oh, and speaking of the voice recording sessions, and yes, I've mentioned this before, but for those that have never heard the anecdote, when we were filming the interviews for the Time Life DVD box set of The Real Ghostbusters, the fantastic Marsha Goodman, the voice director for the show, turned up and just handed me all of the call sheets for the entire series. These call sheets were so precious as they revealed not only when the dialogue for the episodes was recorded, but also all of the uncredited guest voice actors for the show, because there were so many. And this episode had one that I had suspected for years. And when I asked Marsha, she immediately confirmed it. James Avery. Yes, Uncle Phil from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He is the voice of Killer Watt. 
Marsh has stated that this was his very first voice acting role and that he was incredibly lovely. So yeah, there were two voice sessions for this episode. The first session was on May the 27th, 1986 and featured the full cast recording. Arsenio Hall, Maurice LaMarche, Lorenzo Music, Laura Summer, Frank Welker and two guest voice actors. The aforementioned James Avery and Aaron Kincaid who plays the voice of the mayor at the end of the episode. And a second session on June the 10th, 1986 that featured just the four Ghostbusters, Arsenio Hall, Maurice LaMarche, Lorenzo Music and Frank Welker. And those recordings were simply pickups. As this was an early session, it could be that those in charge wanted some of the lines delivered differently as the cast were maybe still finding their feet with these characters. Alongside the second session of pickups, Laura Summer would attend and the full cast would also record the dialogue for the episode Slimer Come Home. Now there's some vocal facts for you. And this may shock many, but I'm not a fan of the scene that we just saw with the Ecto-1 coming to life and chasing after the Ghostbusters. For me, I would have preferred if we had just jumped straight into this scene of the Ghostbusters hunting down Kilowatt in the power plant, because it's far more fun. The background artists do a terrific job with these scenes. Not only does this location feel unique, but the size of it, the scope, it really feels vast and never ending. A perfect environment for Kilowatt and the Ghostbusters to play hide and seek. But first, of course, the jumpsuited paranormal investigators have to deal with the seemingly endless allies of Kilowatt, or at least the army of power plant machinery powered by the mighty spirit. And it is good to see the Ghostbusters separated, although I don't feel enough is made of this moment. You know, united we stand, divided we fall. We should feel like this is a very bad situation. More awesome mechanical designs turned into possessed monsters. I love it. The action for this scene does go a little all over the place with impending battles interrupted by other attacks. But this is probably to show the chaotic nature of Kilowatt's mastery of any and all objects that require power. Thinking about it, Kilowatt seriously had the potential to become one of the Ghostbusters' greatest threats. This spirit has the ability to control and manipulate electricity on a vast scale. That means he could pretty much do anything he wanted. I love how the Ghostbusters are just being dropped into various parts of the power plant and somehow surviving these rather life-threatening falls. I like the animation team that works on this scene. Nowhere near the best for the episode, but they do a good job showing the expressions on the faces of Peter and Winston as they take this crazy ride. We also get a wonderful sense of depth with Kilowatt in the distance. I just love that. Kilowatt almost waiting for them, like the horrific end to a bad ride or something. Again, regardless of the animation, this episode is directed incredibly well. Winston showing he has tremendous strength here, not only to hold the weight of Peter, but also to hold the weight of Peter's proton pack, which, as we saw in the movie, those things weigh quite a bit. This may sound a bit random, but this sequence with the Ghostbusters being separated, encountering their own troubles, only to reunite by falling on top of one another, it actually reminds me of the original Ghostbusters promo, where we see pretty much the same thing. And as the Ghostbusters are reunited, we're about to see a terrific sequence here as the always laughing Kilowatt creates a true physical form for himself. Again, we see a fantastic design showing an inanimate piece of machinery turn into a rather fearsome monster. And this form of Kilowatt is easily my favorite in the episode. Plus, James Avery's voice. Me and my big mouth. I am Kilowatt. My army feeds on your electricity. It makes us so powerful. No human can stop us. Not even you. Come on, this is epic. And as we see, the proton beams have no effect on the spirit. He just absorbs them. This makes him a ridiculously powerful foe. Uh-oh. Mikey likes it. The line, Mikey likes it, is incredibly random. For years, I thought Peter was saying, like he likes it, as in, it's like he likes it, which, yes, is grammatically all over the place. But it wasn't until I saw an ad compilation a few years back and caught the Mikey likes it line from the Life serial commercial and thought to myself, hang on a second, 
close to 40 years after seeing that episode, I finally realised what that line was. After the Ghostbusters have fallen once again to safety, there's a terrific panning shot showing the sheer size of Kilowatt's physical form. But pay close attention to the way the creature is animated. There's real character in it, with Kilowatt turning his head to one side and his expression changes. And I'll remind you, his expression is comprised of inanimate objects, machinery. I love this sequence, and a huge shout out to Shooky Levy's awesome music. Wonderful animation and effects as Kilowatt begins to gain more and more power to the point that the power plant begins to twist and turn into a crazy looking monstrous bat creature. Look at this. This is a really epic moment in the series as the odds seem to be ridiculously stacked against the Ghostbusters. <laughs> I like how Slimer reappears and just begins screaming. Frank Welker, always earning his paycheck. Now, here's where fans will probably be somewhat divided. As this is a network episode, Slimer was pretty much ordered to appear in every episode and, at times, to play a somewhat vital role in the story. The syndicated series had more power to not include him, as I've covered on this channel before. And so, as we see here, he plays a pivotal role in the Ghostbusters gaining an advantage over Killer Watt. Thankfully, the episode doesn't hang on to the fact that Slimer pretty much saves the day, which I will state is a very good thing. Again, the visuals are great here with Kilowatt's physical form lacking all energy and falling to the ground like a rag doll with such believable weight. Look at him go! <laughs> and Kilowatt once again reveals his true form. And he's not too happy with the Ghostbusters as you can imagine. Over our dead bodies! Dead bodies are my specialty! I always thought that line, dead bodies are my specialty, was a pretty dangerous line for a Saturday morning cartoon, especially a network one, where they had to really play it safe where standards and practices were concerned. But yeah, the Ghostbusters are now effortlessly able to trap and contain Kilowatt. Hurrah! The day is saved. Again, we see that panning shot of the bridge with the World Trade Center in the background. Awesome. And now, what we assume is later that day, or possibly the following day, the Ghostbusters have still yet to head back to the firehouse because, as we're about to see, they've kind of forgotten someone. A pivotal member of the team that by now must have the calf muscles of an Olympic cyclist. We did see the odd parade and celebration in honour of the Ghostbusters during the network seasons, less so on the syndicated season. That may be an odd observation, I know, but it's true. And here's the mayor, so we would assume this is Lenny from the original movie. Maybe looking a little different to what he did? Then again, so so too do the Ghostbusters. Keep pedaling, Janine! And yeah, Miss Janine Melnitz is still going strong. I do wonder how long she's been at this for. But keep going, Janine. Don't stab, Janine. So yeah, Kilowatt. One of the earliest episodes of the real Ghostbusters. The show was still finding its feet and so many of the earlier episodes have the Ghostbusters go up against a force that kind of rivals Gozer. Thankfully the series would rein it in slightly and Ghosts revolved more around the plot rather than always being the big bad threatening the entire world. And that's the end of this episode commentary, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.